Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 38 years we have engaged the community in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Our hour-long forums are free and open to all, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary of Westminster Church for upcoming events. Information may be found at westminsterforum.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Michael Beschloss is an award-winning author of nine books on presidential history. He is the presidential historian for NBC News and a contributor to PBS NewsHour. A graduate of Williams College and Harvard Business School, he has served as an historian for the Smithsonian Institution and as a trustee of the White House Historical Association, the National Archives Foundation, and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. He's a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois and has been awarded the Order of Lincoln, the state's highest honor. His books on the presidency include, among others, The Crisis Years, Kennedy and Khrushchev, 1960 to 1963, The Conquerors, Roosevelt, Truman, and the Destruction of Hitler's Germany, and Presidential Courage, Brave Leaders and How They Changed America. His latest book, Presidents of War, has been described by a fellow historian as, quote, a superb and important book and its focus on the President's role as Commander-in-Chief is the topic of today's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Michael Beschloss. Thank you, Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Everyone can hear in back, I hope. Uh, I guess if you can't hear, you can't wave, but uh, <laughs> I, th I think we're probably okay. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, for those extremely nice words. Tim has carefully instructed me to remain in, in time to make sure I don't talk too long. And there's a problem here because uh, I th I'll bet that one or two of you remember the name Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> uh, maybe three. With great admiration, I think all of us, uh, especially given where he was from. And as those of you who remember Humphrey will remember, Hubert was great, but he didn't talk short. Uh, some of those speeches were about three hours, and I always remember that once even he knew that he was talking too long, and he yelled out to the audience, anybody here got a watch? <laughs> and someone yelled back, how about a calendar? So I... Uh, <laughs> I will keep his words in mind and try to make sure I don't go on too long. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. In fact, also reminds me of Humph the president under whom Humphrey served, Lyndon Johnson, who uh, built his presidential library at the beginning of the 1970s. And not too many people came because people were very angry about the Vietnam War. And true story, so Johnson called the guy who makes announcements at the University of Texas football stadium at halftime across the street. He told him, anyone, make an announcement at halftime next time during the game saying, anyone who wants to use the bathroom can come across the street and use the one of the Johnson Library. <laughs> and thousands of people flowed through the front doors and the Johnson Library was then the best attended presidential library <laughs> in the United States. So you, you learn something from these politicians. Uh, you've taken a real risk by inviting me here today to talk about my book. It took 10 years to write, and if I talk in proportion to the length of time it took me to write, I think you will all be here about three weeks from now and I'll still be talking. So, Tim, I promise to keep this brief. Uh, the reason I wrote this book, Presence of War, is because I think we have gotten into too many wars in American history. And so I wanted to write about the eight or nine presidents who were responsible and to figure out why, what their experience was like. Only eight or nine people in American history have had this experience of engaging the United States in major wars from, with major casualties. And I write from James Madison all the way up to Lyndon Johnson. 
would have written about George W. Bush, but I can't do it as history yet because I think that that really requires about 40 years or so until you get sources and enough hindsight to see these things as history and not just as current events. But one thing that really does unite all of these presidents of war is that every single one of them became more religious under the strain of leading the United States into a major war. Abraham Lincoln, when he was a young man, was famous as a skeptic or agnostic or some thought even an atheist when he was in New Salem, Illinois, Tim's in my home state. And one of his, his old friends came to see Lincoln when he was a war president in Washington the last years of the Civil War and found Lincoln reading a Bible and was shocked. Said, I never imagined that I would see you reading a Bible. And Lincoln said, I can't imagine how any president would live under this kind, with this kind of experience without become, becoming more religious or religious at all and finding some sort of spiritual comfort as they made these decisions. Lincoln said, can you imagine that I, who cannot even stand to watch a chicken being slaughtered, I'm making decisions that are responsible for all these men dying. I am responsible for oceans of blood. Lincoln always had empathy. Lincoln was told that there are so many people dying as a result of the decisions he was making that they needed a new national cemetery. And Lincoln said, put it near my summer home because every time I go to my summer home in the morning and the evening when I come back, I want to be confronted with those Union graves being dug. I want to see the terrible results of the decisions that I'm making. I never want to get too disconnected from that. Lyndon Johnson, the last throes of Vietnam, his daughter Lucy had converted to Catholicism at the age of 16, and she took her father with her to Mass Lincoln was so, or, or Johnson was so comforted by this that Lady Bird told me late in her life that at a certain point she thought that LBJ might convert to Catholicism because he found so much comfort in religion. And this is someone who basically had been, you know, uh, had gone to church and was well photographed doing so, but religion had not been a big part of his life. So that's one thing that you find that they all had in common. Another is that every single one of them had the honor of being married to strong women. Made a very big difference. You can clap for that, I would. Uh, someday, if Tim will be nice enough to invite me back, I hope I can say that uh, another president, hopefully not a president of war, was married to a strong man. Uh, But for instance, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, had problems in her marriage early on, which are famous. She stayed with FDR because she felt that the two of them sh shared political ideals. And that was until early 1942, the first couple of months of World War II. FDR was debating whether to intern Japanese Americans, send them to concentration camps for national security reasons, although many of his aides were saying it wasn't necessary. And Eleanor said basically, do not do this horrible violation of civil liberties, it's unhuman. And one day he did it. February of 1942, uh, FDR signed that fatal order. And Eleanor Roosevelt's friends said that their mar marriage was never the same from that moment on because it showed her that maybe they did not share the same political ideals after all. So one way of looking at these presidents of war is to look at them from the inside, see what they had in common. I thought I'd sort of run through a few of them and show how all this happened and talk particularly about the cases in American history where presidents took us into wars that perhaps they shouldn't have done or perhaps did not do it in the right way. The book opens in August of 1814. And everyone here I know is a great student of history and knows that DC had a little problem, which is the British were burning down the White House and the Capitol. And I open with this scene of James Madison running through the dark forests of Virginia, escaping the British who wanted to basically hang him, and they were out to pursue him. And he kept on getting off of his horse in the rain and looking back and saw this otherworldly scene of Washington being burned, sort of the sign that this war had gotten about as bad 
as it could have gotten. But as I looked at the War of 1812, I'd ask two questions. What was the first war that America lost? Wasn't Vietnam, it was the War of 1812. Because we were trying to get the British to stop harassing us, we were trying to seize Canada, neither of those things happened. And the other thing is, what was the most unpopular war in American history? It was not Vietnam, it was the War of 1812. Almost half the Congress was against it, half the public, yet James Madison, though, though he was a founder, took us into a war that many people objected to and we did not win. Despite that, later Americans saw 1812 as a great victory because there were so many of these great scenes. The Star Spangled Banner, Andrew Jackson at uh, New Orleans, you know, don't give up the ship. And one of those was James Polk, who in the 1840s did what I see as a terrible thing for good reasons. The good reason he had an ulterior motive was he wanted to get about a million square miles of land from Mexico, make us for the first time a nation coast to coast, but did it in a terrible way. He staged a fake incident on the Texas border and went to Congress and said, we've been attacked by Mexico. We need a major war against Mexico all the way down to Mexico City which is what happened. But it was a war that was based on a fake, fake pretense and that was not the last time presidents did that. Uh, I won't mention any names. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think, is the best of our presidents of war, mainly for one reason above all others, and that is that if a president ever has the sad duty of taking America into war, for necessary reasons, all of us have to make absolutely certain that he does it as a moral leader. And Lincoln is a very good example of that because if you look at Lincoln during the first year of the Civil War, he was eager not to seem like too much of a crusader. And many of you will remember reading about this. Lincoln would say, you know, I am engaged in, in a northern war against the South because the South seceded. I took an oath to fulfill the Constitution. The Constitution says that there's a union and the, and the South rebelled against that, so therefore I'm doing this almost legally to fulfill the Constitution. That's what this war is about. That's not moral leadership. That was basically, he was trying to explain this in a way that was not provocative. And it was not working because many, especially Northern families who were losing you know, their sons were saying, why are we losing all these children? Is this just sort of a legal exercise? And there's a moment in the Civil War, which it's sort of like the moment, you know, you've all seen The Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color. It was almost like that. Lincoln sort of drops the talk about this is just a legal exercise, and he begins talking about the Civil War as a moral crusade, and that this is a war to extinguish the evil of slavery. And the second that he begins, this is a good lesson for all of us, the, the, the second he begins talking in terms of moral leadership and moral issues, that's when people really begin to follow. He's a better commander in chief. Those who are in the field feel that they're risking their lives for a moral issue, not just to sort of litigate the Constitution. And that is what leads to the rhetoric that we remember from Lincoln of the Gettysburg Address or the second inaugural. Lincoln finally said, I think I'm going to go down in history, not just as the commander in chief who led the North to victory, but as the liberator of a race. That is American moral leadership at its finest. I wish we had it today. And then among the presidents of war, Lincoln is followed by William McKinley. There was a sinking of an American ship called the, the Maine in Havana Harbor. And McKinley went to Congress and said, we have to have a major war against Spain for sinking our ship. Turns out, unfortunately, privately, he knew that there was a good chance the Spanish did not sink our ship. The ship sank, and it wasn't the Spanish. It was a boiler accident. The problem is you can't go to war against boilers, so he went to war against Spain. And the result was a major war that involved the Philippines for years. We changed the government of Cuba, we took Guam, we took Puerto Rico. 
But the problem is that presidents are setting examples all the time, and the presidents should not do things that are dishonest, and they should not violate the Constitution. <laughs> we can clap for that, too. You know, occasionally history does one or two, have one or two lessons. And so we fought this war, but it was for an incident that never happened. It was a very bad example to send to later presidents. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, 1917. Are there any Wilson descendants here? <laughs> any members of the Wilson Anti-Defamation League? Uh, not one of my favorite presidents, not because he didn't do great progressive reforms, and you can argue getting involved in World War I, round or flat, but again, Wilson, who had written about the importance of honesty in a president, for instance, ran in 1916 for re-election on a slogan which was completely dishonest. It was, he kept us out of war. And the suggestion is, vote for him, we'll keep you out of war again. It was a very close election. The election came down to the votes of California, and specifically the votes of women in California who could vote in 1916 in California. They heard he kept us out of war. They wanted peace. They voted for Wilson because they thought they were getting peace. He won re-election under false pretenses. Very soon into his second term, Wilson took us into war. And the problem here is that not only is it a bad thing for presidents to promise things that they do not deliver, but later on he was for the League of Nations to try to keep us out of a second world war and made a lot of mistakes that kept America from entering the League of Nations. And the result was the rise of Adolf Hitler and the coming of World War II, which, with which Franklin Roosevelt had to deal. With the exception of the Japanese Americans, uh, a huge exception, and I think Roosevelt could have done war, more to thwart the Holocaust, FDR learned from Wilson's lesson. He had been his assistant secretary of the Navy. It made him a, a more courageous and effective war president when we were fighting World War II. Harry Truman, I love. Anyone here disagree? More or less, made some different mistakes. You know, you can argue some of those decisions, but uh, tried to approach things in a way that drew on history. This is someone who uh, always said he couldn't understand how you could be president of the United States and not know anything about history. And Truman, you know, read a lot of history as a kid. His favorite book, I apologize for the title, but this is what he loved. It was called, horrible title, Britain, 1895, Great Men and Famous Women. 1895, can you believe it? And the subtitle was From Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt. So covered a wide swath of human experience. But Truman said he couldn't understand how a president could make decisions under pressure, you're deciding on a lot of things at the same time, you don't have enough information. He said the only user's guide is to know where other presidents succeeded or, or failed. Truman said, not every reader on earth will be a leader, but every leader must be a reader. <laughs> Should be a law for all of our presidents. And then finally, to keep in time, Lyndon Johnson fighting that war in Vietnam that was so unnecessary. Remember I was talking about Polk and the fake incident in Texas, and McKinley and the sinking of the Maine by the Spanish, which was not sunk by the Spanish. Bad examples for LBJ in 1964. There was a report of an attack on the ship and the, on, on a, an American vessel in the Gulf of Tonkin. Johnson went to the Senate and House and said, I need a resolution to use armed force in Asia, passed almost unanimously. And a couple weeks later, he privately found that there was no such incident. Never went back to Congress, never said it in public, and so for 10 years almost, Johnson and Richard Nixon waged this Vietnam War based on a resolution that was based on an incident that never happened. 
And two moments I'll talk about with LBJ and Vietnam, and then I'll close to keep within time. Number one, do you all know that LBJ made these tapes of his private conversations? About 700 hours, I've done some books on them. I've listened to every hour. I've been straining not to speak with the kind of language that LBJ used in this <laughs> sacred space. Uh, you get like that if you listen to him too often. But there's a conversation he's having in 1964, and he's talking to Richard Russell, the hawkish senator from Georgia, who was his mentor. And Johnson says, what does Vietnam mean to me? Why do we have to fight this war? And Russell tells him, I say, get out of there. You get into Vietnam, it'll last, that war will last for 10 years, it'll kill 50,000 Americans, and we will not win. He was absolutely right. And I so much wish that I could have gone through time and told LBJ, listen to what he's telling you, but he didn't. One good deed that LBJ did in Vietnam, I was able to find sort of the missing pieces of the puzzle. Beginning of 1968, this was when the book came out about a month ago, it was on the front page of the Sunday New York Times. And for someone who writes about dead presidents, I'm not really used to that. <laughs> uh, but what happened was, you know, those of you who remember Vietnam, beginning of 68, we were losing or stalemated. And Johnson's commander says, William Westmoreland, why don't we move nuclear weapons into South Vietnam and use them to prevent a defeat? And to Johnson's great credit, he says, absolutely not. You know, I want you to lock up any document in which you've said that. If that happens, it could lead to a nuclear war involving the Russians and the Chinese. We could lose 100 million people. You could incinerate the Northern Hemisphere. Perfect example of how crucial it is to have a president of the United States with experience and wisdom and judgment. It makes a difference. So the final point I would like to make is this. Uh, we're all Americans. The highest form of patriotism is not just supporting our presidents, but criticizing them. Where we have gone wrong in American history is when presidents are not criticized enough. That's what the founders hope would differentiate us from England. You know, the kings and the dictators in Europe made mistakes because there was no criticism. They did what they felt like. They wanted America to, be do, to do something different. And the other thing I'll leave you with before we go to questions is remember that many of the abuses of power by presidents of the United States have been in wartime. Anyone happen to get a couple of weeks ago a presidential alert announcement on your iPhone? Maybe that was benign this time, but in the future we may get messages from a president of the United States in wartime that may not be so benign. Presidents can declare martial law in wartime. That was when Franklin Roosevelt did what he did with the Japanese Americans. Woodrow Wilson passed an espionage act that allowed presidents of the United States to harass journalists. So the final point I would make is from looking at presidents of war in history, the times when we have had to be most worried about our, our republic have been perhaps when presidents have been tempted to get involved in major wars for political reasons, or if they've been involved in wars for good reasons, when they've temp been tempted to make themselves very strong in ways that violate our liber liberties and raise the, the danger of our democracy be uh, being constricted in a way that we may not get it back. So all I'm saying, all of you in this room and all listening on the radio, you're all the watch people on the ramparts. We are all depending on you to preserve democracy from the sometimes good, sometimes bad judgments of presidents. And I guess I would probably close with the words of Benjamin Franklin, which is, and this should be something that I wish Franklin were here to tell every single president of the United States, your critic is your friend. Thank you all so much for being here.
Thank you, Michael Betchloss. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicola Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is acclaimed historian of the presidency, Michael Beschloss. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, the co-sponsor of tonight's forum, Hennepin County Library, and our online media sponsor, MinPost. This is the last forum of the year, and we invite you to join us for our winter-spring 2019 season, which will be announced in January. Look for more information on our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Michael Beschloss, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from the audience. First question has to do with the uh, military experience of presidents. Have you found that a, a president with military experiences in his life before becoming president responds differently to the threat or possibility of war? I think so, because you remember what I was saying about empathy? You always want a president with empathy. You want a president who honors the sacrifices of our soldiers. And for instance, Richard Nixon once during Vietnam said, I don't want to get myself too emotionally involved in this, with the soldiers. I want to make these decisions as if I were dealing with chess pieces. Not what you want. And a president of the United States who has had the experience of fighting in war and knows what the flesh and blood results are of the decisions that he is making, I think it only strengthens him as a leader. Dwight Eisenhower, a perfect example. When you look back at the wars in American history, uh, are there any that might be uh, judged to be a just war by, by the uh, hind hindsight in history? And which would be the most egregious as an unjust war? I think in terms of just war, uh, I don't know anyone here who would not wage World War II all over again. And I think we were very lucky. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt had his ups and downs, but we had a, a leader that far-sighted and talented that when he was running for president in 1940, uh, the easiest thing for him politically would have been to say, you know, I'm an isolationist like so many Americans, and I will promise we will never get involved in a war. Had that happened, we probably would not have rearmed quickly enough, and there is a very good chance that after 1941, this would have been a much uglier and much more cruel uh, world. And the other thing is, in terms of ju uh, just, I'm not talking about only ends, but also means. What the founders dreamt of was that we would be li living in a system in which our presidents were honest with us and honest with Congress. I know that seems a little antique, but uh, <laughs> it, it's still an aim. And the problem is that originally the founders were worried that presidents would be tempted to take us into wars for political reasons, just as the kings of England and other dictators in Europe had done, because, you know, the king gets to be unpopular. What's the fastest way of regaining your popularity? You contrive a reason for war, and it unites the public. Everyone loves the king, even if the war was not necessary. And so that's why our founders said, presidents cannot declare wars. Wars should be declared by Congress. Remember that? Uh, anyone remember when the last time Congress declared a war was? 1942. All right, here's a quiz question. Have we had any major wars since 1942? <laughs> There's a problem here, which is that Congress has too often behaved like lapdogs rather than letting presidents. You can clap for that, too. And we've seen it in recent times. And that is not patriotic. Presidents make mistakes. You need leaders of Congress to say you're going wrong. Lyndon Johnson during Vietnam had a majority leader, Mike Mansfield, who hated the Vietnam War, told Johnson, every week you're doing this wrong. It drove Johnson crazy. But he was a better president of war than had Mansfield not been there. All I'm saying is in the future, all of us must demand that Congress never again allow a war to be waged 
without a president constitutionally going to Congress and saying, I want a declaration of war. And, and if that means that we have fewer wars, uh, so be it. Uh, this, this question follows on that, actually. Your, your, most present, your uh, recent book is Presidents of War. Here's a question about if you were to write a book called Presidents of Peace, which presidents would be included in that book? Well, I'll tell you one who's not remembered enough in Presidents of Peace, and it's actually the one that I begin this book with as the positive role model. Uh, anyone here uh, know a lot about the Chesapeake and the Leopard? Uh, I hope not. Well, maybe you've read the book, so you're, <laughs> we've got a ringer here. Uh, it's the first chapter in my book. And what it is is that in 1807, there was a conflict between a British ship called the Leopard and an American ship called the Chesapeake off of Virginia. And the Brits won, and the Chesapeake surrendered. And there was a huge wave of anger in the United States, and the president was Thomas Jefferson. And Americans were saying, we want a war with England, we're so angry. And Jefferson, with great statesmanship, said, yes, there is anger against this, you know, this, this attack on our ship, but I don't think we really have a cause of war against the British. And also, the founders wanted us only to get involved in a war if it was absolutely necessary for our national security. And I don't want to do it for that reason. And also, I don't want to become you know, do it just to, to enhance my own popularity. And Jefferson later wrote to a friend, if I had wanted to start a war, all I would have had to do is open my hand. And as a result, he kept his, his hand closed and there was no war. And it was because Jefferson was peace loving, he was worried about what happens in wartime, he was worried that presidents abuse their power, just as I was saying earlier. And so the result is that not many people know the story of the Chesapeake and the Leopard and Jefferson, but I hope that more people do, you know, maybe from reading my book or, or from other reasons, because it's a wonderful example of how much impact a president can have if there is something that leads people to start a stampede toward a war that is not really necessary. In the future, when you elect a president, may I suggest that one of the things you should think about is Let's say there's an incident that might cause people to say, well, maybe we should go to war, but it's a close call. Let us make sure that whoever is president is never going to involve us in a war only to enhance his own popularity. Two days after the 100th anniversary of the armistice, uh, World War I, uh, can you Give us an opinion as to whether or not the USA would have been better off, or the world perhaps would have been better off if we had not gotten involved in World War I. Yeah, I think you can argue it both ways. I mean, Wilson's argument was really that unless we help to stop the Germans from attacking ships on the North Atlantic, we would not be safe either. My problem with Wilson is that he never really explained that to Americans. Uh, we lost this enormous number of people. You know how many people we lost in World War I? It was only a year and a half our involvement. We lost 116,000 Americans. Those were the ones who were not honored by our president last weekend in Paris when he did not go to. Uh, that's why I think it is, that was such a blow. Uh, a, larger note, a larger understanding of history, I think, would have suggested that that sacrifice should have been honored. But the thing is that Wilson, I think, should have spent that war essentially saying, this is the reason we're making this sacrifice for ideals that seem a little distant. For the first year that Wilson was in office, Wilson did not, you know, we remember him as making these great speeches. He made very few of them during the first year. And the result was that at the end of the American involvement in World War I, by the time of the armistice that Tim is talking about, Many Americans did not know what the sacrifice had been made for. And by the 1930s, many Americans looked back on, back on World War I and said, it was a failure. Why did we lose so many Americans? We must never do that again. And who did that wind up harming? It was Franklin Roosevelt who was trying to make the argument 
let's at least think about opposing Adolf Hitler to make sure that we don't get involved in another war that might end in a world of dictatorship, and it was a very close call. So I admire Wilson's idealism. I think I understand his reasoning. I wish he had been successful in taking us into a League of Nations, but the net effect of all this was that Americans almost prevented us from getting involved in World War II in which we helped to save the world. Number of students in the room, one of them sends a question up. What is the most important, the single most important trait or characteristic in a wartime president? Uh, moral understanding. Because taking Americans into war, that's a moral exercise above anything else. And it's the gravest thing that a president can do, the gravest decision he can make. And remember I was talking about LBJ a couple of moments a few minutes ago. Let me also mention another one. And that is 1965, February of 1965. There's another tape in which LBJ is talking to his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, you remember that name, whom I see as uh, well-intentioned but one of the villains of history because McNamara on these tapes is telling LBJ, you must get involved in Vietnam. President Kennedy would have done it if he were alive. Uh, and this is essential to winning the Cold War. McNamara later wrote a book denying that he had said those things. He did not realize that shortly thereafter, tapes were open showing that he had. <laughs> I guess it's a less lesson to public servants. If you're gonna say something that didn't happen, make sure that there are no tapes. But LBJ is talking to McNamara, it's February of 1965, and it was the first month that LBJ was sending American troops into Vietnam in a very big way. Anyone remember that, early 65? A lot of us. I was, I think, nine years old, I remember it very well. And LBJ is saying to McNamara, at the same time in public, he's telling the troops, we win the war as we fight, and these idealistic young kids. In private, he's telling McNamara, I can't think of anything worse than losing the Vietnam War, and I do not see any way that we can win. This is the first month that this war is really beginning. And in terms of moral understanding and moral leadership, I love so many things about LBJ. I love him on civil rights. I love the fact that he had the heart to do what he did on Medicare and voting rights, so many other things. And I cannot understand how that big-hearted man could have at the same time in private allowed himself in private to say, essentially, I'm sending all these young men, some women, off to Vietnam to die in a war that even today, even at the very beginning, I don't think we're going to win. It's pretty close to being you know, one of the gravest and hardest to defend things that a president does. So you're asking what's the most important thing in a president? Understanding that, at least for us Americans, and we still have to be idealistic, any war has to be a moral crusade. And if a war does not meet a moral test, we should not be fighting it. Another question from a student in the, in the audience. You mentioned earlier that presidents should follow the Constitution, though there are times when the that, president... That, that used to be sort of an undebatable proposition. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but you also pointed to times when the president disobeyed the Constitution, exceeded his authority, such as the Louisiana Purchase. At what point uh, is the president's action bumping up against constitutional authority? Who determines where and when that, that line is uh, exercised. Yeah, I'd, I'd make an argument on, on the Louisiana Purchase, but whoever the student is is a very good student. Thank you very much for the question. Typical Minnesota student. Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I should say, I always love uh, coming to Minnesota because it's sort of, you know, I live in D.C. It's like breathing the fresh air of democracy. Uh, <laughs> And growing up in Chicago, I did not have the Athenian experience of democracy that you all have here in <laughs> Minnesota. Remember when I was growing up, there was a, I think there was a Cook County official who was taken off to prison for bribery. And just as he was going into the prison, you know, he had his handcuffs and the reporters were saying, all right, you're going to prison now. 
isn't this time to confess that what you did was wrong in terms of taking bribes? And the county official said, I can't really confess. You know, they tell me I was taking bribes, but I always just felt like a barber accepting a tip. <laughs> so if there's a, a, a moment that tells you the difference between politics in Chicago and politics here in Minnesota, <laughs> maybe that one does it. Uh, you, you can clap for that too, I will. I, I've been trying to make up for this ever since. So in terms of uh, deciding whether a president has violated the Constitution, ultimately, aside from the divine, there are two judges. One is the Supreme Court. And let us hope that there is not a majority that will vote only for President Trump because two of them were appointed by him. The happy prospect is to look back to 1974. Everyone remember United States versus Nixon, the tapes case? Uh, many people were worried the Supreme Court would vote with Nixon because he had appointed four of those justices, including Warren Burger, who was the chief justice, was a shining moment for our democracy. And that is because every single one of the, uh, those justices who were appointed by Nixon one of them recused himself, William Rehnquist, because he had been in the Nixon Justice Department. The other three voted with the majority of eight to nothing to subpoena Richard Nixon's tapes, which sent him into retirement for violating the Constitution. Great moment in history. And the other way that presidents are prevented from violating the Constitution is something called impeachment. Uh, the upside is that we've had several presidents who have been impeached. The downside in terms of looking at that as a tool, no president yet in our two centuries of American history has gone from impeachment to a Senate trial in which they have been convicted or thrown out of office. So I'm not sure how strong uh, that sanction will be in the future. Number of questions about uh, presidents and criticism. Which of the past presidents have received the most public and news media criticism? I, I think it'd be sort of a 44-way tie. Uh, <laughs> they always hate it. And, and most, of them, most presidents know intellectually that with Benjamin Franklin, their critics are their friends. Not everyone knows that. But oftentimes they forget, and that's just human. LBJ, who knew a little bit of history, not too much, but he certainly knew democracy and he certainly knew the way the system worked. By late in the Vietnam War, uh, he was not someone who would have said, my critics are my friends. He probably would have said the opposite. He was getting very angry, and you hear him on these tapes, and he's saying wild things as he got angrier and angrier at his critics, uh, like Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King are paying rioters in Chicago to riot in order to embarrass me, LBJ. I mean, he was beginning to get almost crazy. And he would use the presidency. Remember I was talking about abuses of power? He would use the FBI to go after his critics. He would use the IRS to go to after his critics. If you were a columnist who was writing columns against LBJ, you'd better have made sure that your taxes were in order and that there was nothing in your FBI file that would not stand released to some hostile person who had access to a printing press. And so what I'm saying is that it's natural for presidents to get angry under the pressures of war. Not all of them did. Abraham Lincoln, I can't find an incident in, an incident in which that ever happened. But I think the lesson of that is, uh, in wartime, always assume that even if you have the most e even-tempered and democracy-loving president at the beginning of the war, that may not be the president that you have by the end. And what about the, the current presidential rhetoric uh, at the press, directed at the press? Is that unprecedented? I have never, ever heard a president of the United States refer to the press as the enemies of the people. Uh, the press drives every president crazy. They hate what they hear. Uh, 
It's like what John McCain said not too long ago to Chuck Todd of NBC. He said, I hate the press, I especially, especially hate you, he said, <laughs> but we need you. That's the proper attitude of a president toward the press. A president who knows history knows how many times the press has found things that our government was doing wrong, criticized presidents, shown them a better way. What's the only business that is explicitly defended in our Constitution? Freedom of the press. Uh, enemies of the people, that's a Soviet term, that's not an American term. And, and saying things like that could endanger the lives of members of our media who are doing, from my point of view, for the most part, God's work. You are, uh, you're, you're a noted presidential historian. I know it's a little early, perhaps, to reflect on the current occupant of the White House, but how do you, how do you as a... Tim, Tim you're baiting me. <laughs> I'm asking this because half the questions have come forward with one version of this I'm or another. I'm surprised it was only half. Uh, <laughs> Professional historian, much acclaimed, a student of history, uh, presidents in American history. How do you think, what's your early take on the, the uh, view of historians on our current president? Uh, I, I really can't give you a historical view because my, this, this is about as deep professionally as it gets. The whole idea of being a historian is, remember I was talking about Bush and Iraq and Afghanistan? You really do, I think, if you're, you're talking about these people as an historian, I mean, I have my own opinions, obviously, but if you're talking about a sitting president as an historian, it's gonna take 40 years to find out what's being said, everything on the inside, national security documents and records and so on. But more important that, than that is hindsight. For instance, when Harry Truman went back to Missouri, 1953, his Gallup poll approval rating was something like about 23%. And when I was a young historian, I was curious why. A lot of people were angry about the Korean War, which was unpopular. There was petty corruption in Truman's entourage. But a lot of people said, I don't like Truman because he doesn't seem like a president, doesn't seem like Franklin Roosevelt. And the true story is told, Truman in 1952, he was asked about Richard Nixon, who was running for vice president. He said, what do you think of Nixon? And Truman told the reporter, I think that Truman is full of manure. And so that was published, you mean actually. Nixon or Truman? Uh, excuse me, I, 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 Truman said, Nixon is full of manure. Uh, so that was published. Thank you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> Nixon is full of manure. And so Truman's aides went to Mrs. Truman best and said, couldn't you get the boss to speak a little bit more elegantly and presidentially? <laughs> And she said, well, you have no idea how long it took me to get him to use the word manure. That's what, that's what she was dealing with. Uh, but the point is that in 1952 or three, whether Truman said manure or not seemed really important in evaluating him as a president. Here we are all these years later with real hindsight. I would say much more important is what you believe about what Truman did on the Cold War, should he have used the atomic bomb, was he right to fire MacArthur? He made all these decisions that were extremely consequential, and it takes you a while to find out how the story turned out, to siphon away the less important from the more important. So as an historian, what do I think of Donald Trump? Uh, you're really egging me on, Tim. Uh, <laughs> I'm open to the possibility as an historian that a half a century later, he may look different in certain respects from the way he does today. I am not predicting this, but it's possible. <laughs> we have time for one final question. Uh, and it has to do with the test of our democracy. Every one of the situations you describe in your book, in a way, is a test of American democracy. And our democracy is being tested today, perhaps as never before or rarely before. Uh, are you hopeful about our, our, our democracy? I am totally hopeful, and I must tell you, one of the, ho the things that makes me hopeful is looking at, out at all of you, if I might clap for all of you, because 
I think we all are on the same side in understanding that. You remember what Benjamin Frank, he not only said your critic is your friend, he also said at the time of Philadelphia, 1787, he came out of the hall and was asked what kind of government the founders had given us, and he said, a republic, comma, if you can keep it. The founders always assumed that democracy would always be in danger and they assumed that it would be in danger most of all from our elected officials. Not that they would be bad people, but that they might make misguided decisions that might violate civil liberties or lead us in a way that would endanger our democracy. So all I'm saying is that anyone who does not have ultimate faith in our democracy, I think every single one of you in this room understands that preserving the system that we were so blessed to live under. That's our job every single day of the week. Please sleep with one eye open. Thank you, Michael Beschloss.